Hello. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I am happy to be here. Uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, to come here to uh, honor uh, Chandan and Professor <coughs> Krishnamurti. Uh, these are people actually <coughs> I have known for many years, like Ajay was saying, 30 years, it's like that. Uh, of course, uh, when, I, when I first came to Bangalore, that was 30 years back. My host was uh, John Don, and we have known each other for uh, <coughs> that that long. And it also sort of collectively uh, in in JNU we, we we have a group which is sort of the interest is very uh, coinciding with with the group in Bangalore. So uh, their work has constantly influenced ours, and and so it's it's a path that we have followed for 30 years. Uh, I, I wish them many more such years. Uh, I will, as as I will try to also demonstrate, <laughs> sort of that the work I, I, I have done, uh, the, the the topics I have chosen, uh, are sort of very closely uh, overlapping with particularly Chandan's work, and <laughs> I'll try to indicate these places. Uh, today, uh, in particular, I'll try to first talk of binary mixtures. So I titled it that way, uh, but I'll try to get back because since it is Chandan, uh, I felt that I should talk a little bit on DFT. So I'll, I'll try to come back to density functional a little bit uh, <coughs> towards the end, maybe last five, 10 minutes. Uh, these are works done over years with, with uh, many students. <coughs> so these are my students in JNU. Some of them are already faculty. Upendra, I think, is already a faculty here. Uh, here means in uh, Bangalore, uh, and uh, Nita is, <coughs> is has just finished, uh, and also this work has towards the end, if I get the time, uh, some some overlap with Chandan's work, which I did with Yalvi Bharat at that time he was in Lyon. Now, <coughs> just a uh, brief outline. First, I'll try to discuss a little bit of nonlinear fluctuating hydrodynamics for dense dense liquids and how this sort of gives rise to self-generated flow dynamics. Uh, this is what is generally known in the in the in the literature and, and to people who work in this sort of thing as as <coughs> mode coupling theory. Uh, what I will try to more uh, illuminate on is, is not so much on the mode coupling theory itself but but what its origins are and <coughs> Uh, in certain way, I have seen <coughs> over the last few years how it, it uh, changes the, the existing mode coupling models for binary mixture. And there, of course, it links to some of the works that Walter Cobb, uh, he, he also is today here, uh, uh, did with Anderson and those simulations and all that. So that uh, sort of formed the interest in, in finding it. I'll try to indicate a little bit on dynamical heterogeneities on higher order correlations from this kind of models. And then if time permits, I'll, I'll <coughs> discuss a little bit on density functional theory on metastable states and some very recent calculations of configuration entropy using this kind of system, but particularly for hard sphere systems. <coughs> now, uh, <coughs> just a, just one transcription on, on the general uh, strategy on these things uh, for last C states, uh, for, for, for dense liquids in particular, maybe last state, uh, generally theories of many particle systems are, are treated as some perturbation around a basic reference state. If it's a low density gas, then one does a theory <coughs> with a large uh, mean free path. So you take the inverse of the large mean free path and usual Boltzmann, uh, this, uh, Boltzmann equation, uh, transport equations, and those kind of theories were very useful for understanding low density gas. For solid, of course, there's an underlying crystalline structure, so one make an expansion around them. Dense liquids, in that sense, is a sort of a, a, a particular case where you don't have such natural uh, small, small uh, parameters to, to expand around, so the theory itself becomes uh, more involved and, and sometimes it's quantitatively not 
controllable. <laughs> so uh, this microscopic approach to this thing, uh, how to how to understand in a system when when you have a many particle system and if it is cooled fast enough, we know that that it goes into an amorphous uh, glassy kind of state. How microscopic theory of statistical mechanics has has given rise to <laughs> how how people have understood it. Uh, now, for an isotropic fluid, of course, these these kind of systems generally are studied in terms of slow modes, and uh, those slow modes are are much slower than what is the microscopic uh, modes in the, in the system. So, uh, and this this has different origins. It's because of conservation laws in the system. Sometimes it's due to broken symmetry in a system. Now, the the conservation of mass, momentum, and, and <coughs> energy fluctuations and all that, that gives rise to this kind of balance equation, which forms the very basis of uh, studying <coughs> such such systems and how the dynamics is, is formulated. These equations, These equations of hydrodynamics uh, will, uh, forms the very very basis of of, uh, of studying <coughs> many particle dynamics, correlations, and all that. And generally, I am relating to here classical systems, so it will be basically talking of classical classical correlations. Sometimes those slow modes can arise out of broken symmetry in the system. Glassy states have been studied using such such models also, uh, with, with new modes <laughs> included into, into this. Now, <coughs> one of the main uh, sort of uh, quantity that is studied is generally correlation functions that we sort of <coughs> do in statistical mechanics. Average equilibrium average in most of the cases. In 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 the theoretical calculation that I will discuss here, I'll basically <coughs> uh, limit myself to equilibrium correlations. And if you just look at the, the normal uh, theory of, uh, of, of a fluid flow density, this kind of correlation function, let's say the density correlation function satisfies a, a damped harmonic wave type equation. And these are sources of sound waves in, in the system. And one can study such things experimentally also. This, uh, these are. <coughs> transforms of these correlation functions uh, and then one can look at different poles of these things. I'm going into this language because this is something that I'll use in, in, in discussing the, the more complicated forms. So usually it's, it's, a, it's a set of equations for the, for the slow modes in the system and then how uh, the time evolution goes is given by those uh, balance equations. Sometimes we put noise in it, and then you average over those noise to calculate the correlation functions. <laughs> now, <laughs> coming from another side, one one can look at such many particle systems as we know from from uh, molecular dynamic simulation, and this is one of the classic examples uh, of this the study of slow dynamics. We always show uh, this is with Bowen Anderson. <laughs> And this is for a binary uh, Leonard Jones system. And as you can see, that the correlation <coughs> first uh, at, at higher temperature decays quite fast, then it slowly develops a plateau. And then <coughs> if you look at the mean square displacement, it goes into a plateau. And this is sort of the reflection of gauge effect. Now, these are, of course, all well known. How to understand this from theory of? Uh, from, from statistical mechanics angle, one of the sort of the classic way of looking at it uh, was looking at generalizing these equations that I, I told <coughs> you about, which you can write as balanced equation, as generalized or nonlinear Langevin equations, and then looking at the corrections <coughs> due to the nonlinearities in these equations, how they will affect the, the uh, the correlation indicates. Suppose I write the equation for the density. For the density, of course, this equation is very simple, and that is the continuity equation. One of the reasons it is so simple is that the that the current 
of the density itself is another conserved variable. For momentum, the, the equation is this, and this is basically the, the two basic equations which people have studied in many different ways. And this is what actually gives rise to all that we know of simple mode coupling uh, or even mode coupling theory, I would say that, that these, these are the two basic equations that controls all this. One has to look at the nonlinear effects that comes from coupling of density fluctuations in these situations. And <clears throat> today I will mainly talk of this, but in, a, uh, in the context of a binary fluid. So that's why <clears throat> giving some, some basics of it. Now, at high density, today earlier uh, memory was sort of discussed. One way of looking at this mathematical sort of uh, nonlinear effects and all that is that it gives rise to, uh, it, it, it gives us a way to understand how memory will affect the dynamics. So if you look at these correlation functions and, and the corrections, they involve wave vector integration. So it's like how structure affects the dynamics of, of the system. That's what is going into it. So there are basically two ways of, of dealing with this. One is looking at these nonlinear equations and looking using you know, different methods. There are, there are many different ways of looking at it, field theoretic methods, uh, <coughs> Mori's ones, extreme, and all that. Uh, and this is called generally called the mode coupling theory. You look at the <coughs> perturbative, perturbative corrections to those transport coefficients in the system due to nonlinearities, and, and this is generally termed as mode coupling theory. First started with with works of Fixman, I think, Kawasaki, Katnoff, Martin, <coughs> and all these people in the context of critical phenomena. But then the, for the slow dynamics, the really the breakthrough came from Quetche and <coughs> his group work. Uh, what they did is they used these corrections in a self-consistent manner, which gives rise to a feedback mechanism and, and creates slow dynamics. The other way of looking at this is, is direct solution of this uh, equations that I, I, I showed, the fluctuating hydrodynamic issues. So these are uh, Langevin equations. So one can directly solve them and calculate correlation functions. And that is where Chandon, of course, uh, was one of the first few people who started it. Uh, initially, Oriol Valls and Jean Mazenko and others did, then Chandon and Oriol did a lot of work on it. I uh, worked on this with one of my students and Janvin Bharat later on. I'll try to say a little bit on this today. But this is another parallel method of looking at these things instead of using the, uh, the usual part very weapon. So these are the two main things. <laughs> what it does, especially in this way, that this kind of density fluctuation correlations in the system gives rise to a feedback mechanism, which uh, arises from density fluctuations, and it gives rise to a slow dynamics. I'll just do a very schematic uh, presentation of this in a second. Uh, <coughs> in studying this, one of the key quantities that people look at is the product of density fluctuations. So if you think of phi as a, as a product of density fluctuations, then the average of it uh, in the long time limit goes to zero. So it, it, it behaves like an order parameter, although it's not really an order parameter in that sense, time correlation function. But if the long time limit of this quantity goes to zero, in the, in, <coughs> then we, we sort of define the system to be ergodic. This is the definition of ergodic. And then there is people, we, we could show, I mean, the, the work of Gersh actually first showed that in at least in a very simple model, uh, there would be an ergodicity to non-ergodicity transition. That means this correlation function will no longer decay to zero, and this is what was termed as the mode coupling transition. Now, one of the key things that happens, this is what I'll focus a little bit more today, that is, it is not only that the long time limit of the density correlation function goes to zero, it's the long time limit of the single particle correlation function. This is the co correlation of collective density fluctuation, and the uh, phi s is the correlation of the self-correlation function. It's the long time limit of this also goes to zero. Why that happens, I'll try to <laughs> eliminate that a little later. But this means that self-diffusion coefficient goes to zero. That means when this transition occurs, the, the self-diffusion coefficient 
also goes to zero. This was the traditional mode coupling model that has been studied by, uh, I think, Goethe and others did it, mainly Bose also did a lot of it. So there is a, a uh, it's sort of sharp transition that they talked about, which process, which not only freezes the collective density correlation function, but freezes also the self correlation. Then different versions of it has evolved. I don't want to go into all that, but the tag particle correlation function decays to zero beyond the <coughs> ergodic denominator. So even if we take this transition uh, and in the simple model, one can show that the tag particle correlation function actually decays to zero, which would imply that this will not be zero at the transition. Now, <coughs> the key mechanism in this is this sort of thing that you have the density correlation function expressed in terms of the generalized transport coefficient or memory functions or whatever you call it. And this in mode coupling theory in lowest order is written in terms of the correlation functions. So you get a self-consistent feedback mechanism by which beyond a certain density, the density is coming here into this kind of constants, the, 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 the structure and all that that the system gets frozen. That means that the density correlation function, the phi of t no longer goes to zero, and phi of z develops a one over z code. As you can see from here, if this gets large, this term becomes small, so it becomes a one over z kind of behavior. One can solve this thing numerically and, and solve a more detailed version of it. This is the original 1984 work of, let's say, and collaborators. And this is the, the collective density correlation function. I'll say ignore the dashed line because the dashed line is for a higher density. This is at the critical point. And then it, the collective density correlation function behaves like this. And the self-correlation function behaves like this. And this, the, the classic sort of the result is that it occurs at 0.5 to 4 packing fraction in a hard sphere system. This also depends on what you use for the for the uh, structure factor, because in all this calculation, the structure of the system, of the fluid goes as an input, so one has to put that and calculate <coughs> the transition point. Now, how does the self-correlation function get frozen? Uh, <coughs> like this, this is what I was showing in the last transparency. The density correlation function behaves like this. What has been argued is that the self-correlation function also behaves like this. This phi s is, is something that is coupled simply to the density correlation function. So as if this equation is slave to this, so as soon as phi gets <coughs> frozen, that means it develops a 1 over jet pole, phi s also gets a 1 over jet pole. And so both of them freezes simultaneously and, <coughs> and, and uh, then things uh, the, the ergodicity, non ergodicity transition signals that the ds goes to zero. So th this was known for, for, for this. <coughs> Why I was interested about this is, is that when I looked at the, the deduction of this, what I realized is that this is obtained by a simple uh, extrapolation of the one component theory. Uh, and <coughs> it's the momentum density of the tag particle which is not a <coughs> on the property. So this is where this thing uh, gets a little different. And let me show what I mean by that. So, <coughs> so the tag particle density is a conserved quantity, but the, the momentum of the tag particle is not a conserved quantity. So we don't want to write a separate equation for the momentum density of the tag particle. And to, to understand this, I sort of looked at the binary mixture uh, uh, model, that you have a binary mixture, row one and row two are two components. So you can work with the density and the concentration variable. And then you get this kind of equation. So you have got a density equation, and then <coughs> you've got an equation for the, an equation for the momentum density. But it's the collective uh, momentum density of both the components, like G1 and G2. Here, I doesn't mean the, the, comp uh, the Species, it means just the coordinate, so <laughs> the, the axis, x, y, z. So there is one equation for g, and then there are two equations. This would be, 
I mean, I can write two equations for rho, rho 1 and rho 2 or I can equivalently write equation for rho which is the continuity equation. Here rho is the total density and then there is an equation for C. So, then we, we, we try to look at what would be the, 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 the corrections due to the, the nonlinearities coming from this kind of equation. Now, one of the other reasons of looking into this is uh, <coughs> around that time when Owen Anderson did those simulations, Hope reported that that if you simply take the, the structure factor from the model and then put it <coughs> in the equations of the existing MCT, you see a transition which is part too earlier than what people uh, could see by extrapolating self diffusion coexistence and all that. So, I wanted to uh, <coughs> look at this structure. So, when we looked at this and then we got a new set of equations for the for the transition point that was definitely at least qualitatively much more agreeing with, with what Walter was finding that the transition is, is much more delayed. So, <laughs> the, the basically by using rho c and this, so at the transition point the correlation function of rho and c all these phases and <coughs> for a binary mixture. Now, in the if we take this binary mixture because I wanted to look at use this model to study the self diffusion also. So, if I take the binary mixture and then take the one component limit by one component limit what I mean is that I make one of the pieces as one particle and then the rest of the particles is n, n minus one particles. So, then <coughs> uh, if we look at the same same uh, model, but take that limit then what we were finding is that the, the, the long time limit of the self correlation function was still going to 0. So, the collective correlation was exactly giving what the one component MCT of uh, the earlier figure I showed you of let say and others was, <coughs> was reducing to. So, the self diffusion coefficient is, is not 0, the, the tag particle correlation function was, was decaying to 0 in the one component limit. <laughs> And this was a work that we, we did, actually I did it quite a while back with uh, Upens uh, and I did this thing, uh, he, he was doing this in his thesis. And uh, <coughs> while we did that, the, the, the results were qualitatively much, much uh, better in better agreement with, with simulations that the, TK, uh, the transition was not, the ergodic normalization transition was not occurring too early. Uh, what I couldn't get from it is that, that the self diffusion coefficient though it was not 0, it was not becoming substantially small. So, uh, what we wanted to and that was the sort of the interest uh, that, that, that came that I wanted to see what is the approximation in these equations that makes the though the self diffusion coefficient may not go to 0, but we all know from simulation and all that the self diffusion coefficient falls very sharply. So, how, how to understand that? Now, <coughs> This thing uh, one can see uh, by doing something which is called an adiabatic approximation. This was originally done by Kawasaki uh, in one of his 2000 papers. It's, it's what is called the, the, the uh, approximation of very fast momentum relaxation. Uh, I'll discuss it in the next transparency, but the, this is quite technical and, and uh, if you are interested, I'll tell you to look at this, there was two long papers you wrote on this in 2015. <coughs> so, what the idea was is that if you take the, the, the momentum density equation and if you sort of think that, that the, the momentum fluctuations are decaying quite faster compared to the density fluctuation, this is called the over damped, over damping limit. You set this equal to 0 and then set the right hand, <coughs> the, <coughs> this side equal to 0 you can get a, a sort of simple relation between the ignoring nonlinearities and all that, the correlation of the density fluctuations and how it is related to this. This is like the current in this, it's a one over rho term. The current current and the density density correlation function would be simply related. So, I did that for the binary system and for binary systems the equations are more complicated. 
But what we could see is the current current correlation functions could be approximate. This is an approximation. So, in this over damping approximation, we could relate the current current correlation functions to the density correlation function. I mean, rho rho correlation or rho and c. Remember, c is the concentration. So, one can look at it as a rho rho and rho c correlation, or one can look at it as a rho 1, rho 2 correlation. It's, it's a it's a matter of choosing, <coughs> cho uh, choosing the, 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 the two sets of variables. I work here with, with density, total density and concentration. One can work with uh, row 1 and row 2. And the correction sort of change in this way that the, the current current correlation behave more like density density correlation function. And so, the, uh, this is uh, more technical, but this is the correction that goes into more coupling calculations to, to the self energies. And the diagrams which which gives rise to this sort of current current correlation now changes into density correlation. So it, it basically gives you back similar kind of couplings that we we uh, I I mentioned earlier uh, in in yeah this kind of coupling density density with the self so. Because the CC becomes the self correlation function in the in the uh, one component limit, this gives the crucial coupling that will set the self diffusion coefficient to zero. So, with the adiabatic approximation, one can go into <coughs> such a model where you will see a simultaneous freezing of this. Uh, what it changed from the earlier model is that, that the vertex functions the, that goes into the MCT that got changed. So. What we could sort of see here, let's say this is the uh, ergodicity, non ergodicity transition, the transition points. So, this is plotted versus x, this is the critical tracking in the system. And as you can see, the original MCT had very little effect of x on this. And this was the model that if we do not, the model that I earlier wrote with you, friends, if we do not do the adiabatic approximation, then the transition is occurring at much higher backing pressure. But if you do the adiabatic approximation, it still has some of the effects, <coughs> but you can see this uh, coming down, but it is still not the, the earlier MCT and that is because of the change of the vertex functions that I mentioned. Uh, these are some of the other results, like if I take the one component limit, I can generate the, this sort of curve, the bell shaped curve they say for the phi CC. I think these two are uh, one for the bullet waste one is out. And here you can see this is very small. So, this is the one with the with the model if we do not do the adiabatic approximation that means the, the long time limit of the tag particle correlation still goes to almost 0. But the collective correlation function exactly becomes the same thing as you would see for one component system. So, for this kind of uh, models, what we are getting is if we take one component limit of the binary mixture, we generate the standard mode coupling results except that the, 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 uh, the vertex of the tag particle correlation is slightly different, but the tag particle also goes to 0. So, the adiabatic approximation plays a key role in it that how you, you, you approximate the density fluctuation, uh, momentum fluctuation decay in the system. I will just indicate here uh, just the, the root of this. Suppose these equations that I showed you, basically we had we had taken an equation for rho and c. I could have worked with an equation of rho 1 and rho 2. And so, the momentum equation is not that, uh, the, the, the continuity equation for the densities are not very different. What is different is this uh, tag particle momentum if you take each of the species and write two equations for them and then calculate the corrections, you get the standard MCT and <coughs> standard MCT means what was earlier proposed. If I take this as a single equation, I do not take two separate components. That means, what I am doing is I am not taking the, uh, the individual density uh, momentum density components as some kind of slow mode, but taking the sum of them as, as slow modes. Then <coughs> Uh, we get the our model, but if we take this kind of equations for two separate things, then you, you get this. So, basically it has to do it at a very microscopic level, it, it has to do with the with the microscopic density, uh, momentum conservation in the system. And 
uh, in this sense, I, I, I would comment that this is sort of thing that we, we, we saw also when we looked at uh, our earlier work on, on, on um, ergodicity in, in, in one component system, that uh, the ergodicity transition really survives when the momentum, <coughs> the, the density correlations and the velocity correlations kind of behave in a similar way. And this is what again is, is occurring here. The adiabatic approximation actually is equivalent to making the density and the velocity correlation functions similar. If we don't do that, then, <coughs> then the system uh, doesn't, the, neither the self-diffusion coefficient goes to zero and neither the, the, the ergodicity restoring mechanisms in, in such system goes to zero. So, uh, <coughs> if, if there is one thing I would like to say is, is this, that, that in all this, in bringing the ergodicity finally uh, in the correlation functions, decaying long time limit of zero, the microscopic conservation laws play, uh, of the momentum conservation is, is, is a key thing. Another thing one can see in this, if you, if you notice, I wrote two equations for the Gs. Now, so it's, it's basically boiling down to writing two equations for the momentum variable or writing a single equation. Now, if I take this model to a, a situation where I look at the Brownian limit, because in my model I can take the mass to be different, the size to be different, so I can choose the species such that the single particle has much higher mass than the other particle. Then <coughs> what happens is these two dashed curve and this curve are sort of predictions from our model and, and the model of uh, uh, Bose and others that uh, you see they are almost same. That is because what's happening is when you have, you are going to the Brownian limit, that means one species is much heavier than the other, then uh, you can think of as if you are writing a Brownian dynamics equation for the single particle, and so you can write two momentum equation and the, and the model becomes sort of correct in that sense. <coughs> so if I take the Brownian limit of our model, then we get the usual, uh, the Bose MC. Another key thing in this is the mass ratio dependence. The earlier MCT, if you look at the equations, the mass of the two species drops out of, from the problem. So what happens is the all these ergodicity, nanogodicity, transition, and all these things become independent of that. It doesn't depend on the mass ratio. And we were the sort of the first to uh, open and I <coughs> we talked about the that, that the mass ratio <coughs> dependence of this. Now uh, it was later on. Uh, it was seen in the simulations by Hartmut Lowen and others that yes, the mass ratio dependence affects uh, the, the uh, mode coupling <coughs> transition. Of course, again, this is a, a rounded version of the transition. They see slowing down and all that. But if they change the mass ratio of the system, then uh, things changes abruptly. <coughs> So recently what I did is, is Nita sort of did in her thesis, uh, we looked at the tag particle diffusion, how, how does it depend on the mass ratio. Uh, so <coughs> I'll just, just show a few results on that. Uh, what happens is the mass ratio, if we like, so DS1, DS2 are the two uh, <coughs> diffusion coefficients of the two species and X is the, the concentration of the bigger, bigger size particle. And so here the mass ratio is kept constant at 10. And you can see that as X goes beyond a certain value, there's a very sharp drop in the mass ratio <laughs> in this. But uh, this is not something that you'll expect in the other model. Here it is more clear. This is cup-wise the mass ratio. So this is done for a fixed X. X is the concentration of the bigger particles. And you can see that, <coughs> that as kappa increases, the self both the self-division coefficients fall. Uh, I, have not, I have not seen come across much results on the study of mass. There are some studies on soft sphere systems. Uh, this was in, in, in a physical UE paper where they see qualitatively same sort of behavior, that as you increase the mass ratio at a fixed x, the diffusion coefficient fall. But I should comment that the, the, the change of diffusion coefficient there is over a 
much weaker range. This is this is a general thing that you see in MCT that the MCT always predicts a stronger change in the in, in the time scale than what you see in simulation. Now, <coughs> let me just say a few things on density function theory. As I said, we go into that now. So <coughs> uh, the the uh, I'll, I'll finish this this thing. Uh, this how much time we still have? Ten minutes. So uh, I'll just very take five minutes uh, for this uh, other thing. So <coughs> basically, uh, the, the the point that I want to make in this is that if I take the momentum conservation carefully, treat the conservation laws which are the origin of the MCT, uh, one can see very strong mass ratio dependence, and it requires more. Uh, study simulation study I think to to really check it <coughs> okay now coming back to density function models all these things that we, we, we I was talking about mainly are on the dynamic space so you, you look at dynamics but there was another way of looking at disordered system and which uh, sort of takes the, the clue from from the uh, approaches of classical density functional theory where you was used by Ramakrishnan and others to study the freezing transition. Uh, this was used uh, to study disordered system. Uh, initially, I think one of the first work on this was by Jaswant Singh and, and Peter Ulinas and others. And around that time, 30 years back, uh, Chandon also <coughs> uh, worked on that and, and showed that if you take Density uh, as, as a inhomogeneous density as a function, you can look at free energies of the system and then look at uh, get local minima of the free energy. This is uh, this Europhysics letter he wrote many years back, <coughs> and it's one of the <coughs> cornerstone of this. So uh, uh, it using that kind of model, <coughs> uh, we we have studied later on 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 uh, glassy systems and all that. I'm not going to all this. But uh, over the last few months, actually, I was sort of re-looking into it because one can use a weighted density functional approach. Weighted density functional approach was something that was used, uh, developed by Ashcroft and others, and, and then uh, more modified and corrected by many. That uh, because the inhomogeneous density is, uh, is very non-uniform, uh, and generally, the, the free energies are written as a power law expansion, uh, sort of like a Taylor expansion in, uh, in the density fluctuation. One needs to correct for the non-uniformity of the density. So, so uh, uh, they, they use some kind of weight function. And so there was something that was studied, uh, used to study uh, crystallization transition, the kind of thing that Ramakrishnan and others did initially, using this kind of weighted density functional so that you have better way of calculating, more accurate way of calculating uh, free energy of inhomogeneous density. Now, in this, the hard sphere system has a particular advantage. And this was mainly applicable for hard sphere system. What they did is, in the crystallization transition, the Hard sphere system goes into a crystalline state. Now, if you think the hard sphere crystal is a very peculiar kind of thing, its particles are still moving in a ballistic way. It's not like a <coughs> normal crystal. So, uh, its particle motions are more like a, a low density gas, except the fact that the particles are moving randomly around some <coughs> positions which, are, which has a long range order, FCC order, and all that. So, if there is some way of mapping out this underlying order, one can map a, a crystal into a low density fluid, hard sphere crystal. And then the low density for, uh, as I was saying in the beginning also, for low density system, it's, it's quite easy to cal accurately calculate free energies. So one can use this method. So you use a mapping to, uh, to map the free energy of the, of the inhomogeneous uh, hard sphere solid crystal or amorphous into a, a non-uniform uh, in, into an uniform liquid of low density and then calculate free energy. So we, we did that using this kind of method uh, and then looked at the free energy minima and all that. 
while doing that i realized that we can also calculate the configuration entropy of the system so basically we, we looked at the total entropy and and the key reason you can do it is for hard sphere system the entropy is just three half minus this the interaction part of the potential uh, energy is zero so this is where uh, it becomes very useful but using this then i can calculate the configuration entropy these are two different underlying structure for which we have calculated one is this circle and the, and the square the, uh, these other graphs like this this dashed graph this is the calculation of parisi and zamponi using these are much more sophisticated uh, not uh, sophisticated but these are much more um, uh, involved models where uh, one uses replica uh, models to average out the 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 uh, different uh, the, you actually calculate using replica model the 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 partition function and then from that you calculate the number of free energy minima from that you calculate you can calculate the configuration entropy here of course we are just calculating it using simple experimental route that that the configuration entropy is total entropy minus vibrational entropy and uh, what we get from the density functional theory it looks quite close to that so that's another simple result that follows from density <coughs> i think i have run out of time now so i'll stop uh, these are other things we have done using again dft but it can go on uh, because as i said my uh, association with chandon is so long that we keep working on many different things which are very similar to when i'm tempted to say this but i, I think i'll stop thank you questions So I have two questions. So the fact that um, if you have two different masses, uh, the diffusion constants are the same if they are the same, and the diffusion constant was the highest. Does, is this a, a really a universal rule? Because if I want to equilibrate the binary system, so I can choose mass ratio whatever I want. And since I'm stingy and lazy, I want to be as quick as possible. So, um, what is your advice to do? Same masses, always. No, no, but advice in what sense? Like, what would uh, give you quick result? No, no, no. If you uh, want to study the mass ratio dependence, no, 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 the, the, the equilibrium result does not one. depend on, the, the structure does not depend on the mass ratio. Yeah, so if... So, uh, therefore, I want a, a dynamics which is as quick as possible. Therefore, I want a high diffusion coefficient. The diffusion coefficient was falling when the mass ratio was low. But is it always a maximum at one? Is kappa equals one? This I I I think would be. If I, I if I say something, I could be wrong uh, because one has to really solve the equation to see it. So let me not jump into a, a solution. But uh, what we see the trend is when the mass ratio is large. Mm -hmm. it's equal to the, okay. and the second question short. Um, so you, you talked about the diffusion coefficient, but um, often one is uh, interested in the alpha relaxation time, which if things are easy, it's just the inverse, but sometimes things are not easy. So can you say something about the tau and not about the D? Tau from the collective relaxation? Or from yes. The... I would say that, that uh, so you're saying how the mass ratio will, uh, will affect the, the yep. collective relaxation. See, the mass ratio generally, it's, uh, we have sort of studied different situations in, in, in this John of Sarsky's paper that generally it's a very uh, intricate play between the two uh, effects. One is how you take the size and how you take the mass. Mm -hmm. so it could be that the, that the uh, long time relaxation will slow down if the X is in a certain range. You know, not only X, sorry, the size ratio, alpha. Yeah, yeah. Given the mass, but if you change the alpha, and then you change the mass ratio, then you may see a, a more uh, shifting of the of the uh, uh, alpha relaxation time. So this is a intricate sort of play between the two effects. One is 
one size is becoming smaller, other is becoming small, larger, or the bigger particles, the inertia is changing. So inertia and size both are playing a role in it. So at least in, in, in some of the calculations, you are saying that the uh, self-diffusion constant will not go to zero when the collective uh, density correlations, they freeze, right? So, I mean, uh, is there any feature? I mean, is there a feature of uh, the fact that your collective uh, density uh, correlations have frozen yeah. in the dependence of uh, the self-diffusion constant? Well, self-diffusion coefficient generally is slowing down, but it's not going to exactly zero. Hmm. Now, if you sort of uh, say that, would, they, would it then be correct to extrapolate the self-diffusion and, you know, and take that as the transition point? That's, that's one question, one may pose the question. In that way, I'll say that in any case, the transition doesn't take place, so the self-diffusion coefficient <laughs> going to zero may give you a feeling of it. Uh -huh. that, that, that's, but uh, it's... Uh, if one really wants to sort of see where this ideal transition would be, I think the best thing to do is to solve the, put the structure and see what he did with Naurath and Cope, that what would be the transition point, the theoretical transition. Uh -huh. But the self diffusion coefficient extrapolation going to zero gives you a sort of feeling, experimental sort of feeling that, okay, how the system is slowing down. So qualitatively that is okay, but I, I don't see calling that as a mode coupling transition. But if I just looked at the self diffusion coefficient and looked at, let's say, how it changes with temperature or right. something like that, yeah. from that I would not be able to guess anything about where the collective thing is freezing. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is that the collective thing doesn't freeze anyway, so why take that here? It's a process. 